Welcome to the Museum RFIT's Material Evidence, Assessing Risk in Museum Collections Virtual Symposium. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs. It is my honor to introduce Anna Rose Keefe and Brianna Joy Turner, who will present the talk, Collections Care and XRF Analysis at the RISD Museum. Anna Rose Keefe is passionate about textiles design and collaborative conservation work. She works at the Rhode Island School of Design Museum as a system textile conservator, focusing on facilitating access and caring for the collection. Brianna Joy Turner is currently a pre-program objects conservation assistant at the RISD Museum. We thank the US Institute of Museum and Library Services as this project is made possible by a grant from IMLS. We hope you enjoy the show. So hello, and thank you to Anne Coppinger and the museum at the Fashion Institute of Technology for inviting us to speak with you today. We're going to chat a little bit about how we've used XRF analysis at the RISD Museum. My name is Anna Rose Keith. I am an assistant textile conservator at the Rhode Island School of Design Museum. Um, and in my daily work, I focus on caring for the permanent collection when it is not on view. And I am passionate about increasing access to works of art that are not on display. My name is Bree Turner, and I'm a pre-program conservation assistant in the objects department of the RISD Museum. My general day-to-day -day includes writing condition reports, digitally documenting, and cleaning objects for upcoming exhibitions and rotations. We're not conservation scientists or expert in X-ray fluorescence, which we'll be referring to as XRF throughout this presentation, but we have been lucky enough to have access to XRF as a resource at RISD. XRF analysis can be used to produce a list of elements present in a work of art. In this presentation, we'll discuss how we've used XRF in recent projects and what we've learned from those results, as well as how we prepare for and manage a day of analysis and some of the other things we wish we had known before we started. Uh, RISD is an art museum attached to a design school. The collection is used for teaching and exhibition. Uh, we have a conservation staff of five and an ambitious exhibition schedule, so we rely heavily on work-study students, interns, and fellows to achieve goals that would otherwise be outside the scope of a small museum. Our conservation department has grown in the last few years, and that includes hiring both of us, um, but the museum had no full-time conservator until 2008. Uh, which means that many of our records related to treatment and collections care are incomplete or absent. For example, there's no records of pesticides being used at the museum ever, uh, but there are so few records from the 19th and 20th centuries um, that we can't assume it never happened. So XRF analysis can really help us close the gaps in our understanding. And because we are so often working with students in the collection, it's really important for us to make sure uh, that we're not exposing students or researchers to potential hazards. We're located in Providence, Rhode Island, right down the hill from Brown University, which has world-class R1 science departments. There's so much we want to analyze in the collection, but we do not have access to XRF analysis if our senior conservator, Ingrid Newman, had not worked to build relationships with Brown University science departments. Many projects we'll be discussing today were supported by Dr. David Murray and Jamie Pahagin of the Geochem Department at Brown. Dr. Murray is the recently retired director of Environmental Chemistry Facility, and Jamie Pahagin is the Geochem Department Laboratory Manager. They use an Olympus Delta XRF machine in their soil analyses and have been kind enough to offer us their time and machine for looking at works of art. We've also recently been able to connect with the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, NCPTT, through Dr. Katherine Cooper, who completed her postdoctoral work at the RISD Museum. NCPTT has a portable Bruker XRF unit that Dr. Cooper uses when she visits the RISD Museum, generously sharing her time and expertise. Our analysis of these results has also benefited greatly from the advice of other conservators, including Nancy Odegaard, Landis Smith, Rika Smith McNally, and others. Many thanks to them and everyone who has supported our work through RISD. So to begin with, I would like to share some of the recent projects we've done and the conclusions we've drawn. In these cases, we were looking for information about provenance, pesticides, original construction materials, and historical context. 
And these hopefully will provide you with a few ideas about how XRF can enrich conservation work and museum work. The machine we work with most frequently is an Olympus Delta. XRF readings should always be considered suggestive and not written in stone. When we take a reading, uh, we get a visual map of the elements seen here, that's the graph. And we also get a list of elements present organized from largest concentrations to least uh, in parts per million. Um, I'll give specific numbers throughout this presentation, such as 25 parts per million or 1000 parts per million, because I think it's helpful to have an idea of the scale, uh, but these quantities are not exact. At the bottom of the screen, you might even see um, very low quantities of unexpected elements like two parts per million uranium or three parts per million yttrium. Uh, we tend to ignore these results if they're unexplainable and in really small quantities and we don't use them to draw conclusions. Uh, that said, some of our recent projects include a survey of taxidermized birds on hats, muffs, and other Victorian fashion accessories. We were lucky enough that we didn't see arsenic on hats that were just decorated with feathers, but universally we saw high and dangerous concentrations of arsenic on taxidermized birds with heads. Arsenic was used as a preservative to keep the skin intact historically and prevent the loss of feathers. These items used to come out every year for a class on animal products. Previously, they were handled by staff members and presented to students. Um, however, now we've been able to remove the hazardous pieces, label them, box them, and they live in a separate, less accessible part of storage. Next came a survey of arsenic greens in 19th century wallpaper and fashion. We found really high levels of arsenic in the wallpaper, which we will talk more about later. Um, but we also looked at green silk dresses and accessories. We were looking at emerald green, as well as at these medium sort of sickly green tones, which we refer to as suspiciously green because we were suspicious that they were full of arsenic. Uh, we took our readings from the seam allowances where the textile was least likely to be faded or abraded. Um, and for the emerald green fabrics, we found no traces of arsenic. There were some medium greens that contained very low levels of arsenic, but most of these were less than 25 parts per million, and many were low enough that they fell within the machine's margin of error. When dealing uh, with textiles that are in good condition and behind glass, uh, museum viewers aren't at risk from arsenical green dyes. Heavy metals, are most, uh, heavy metals are most harmful when they are ingested. So the rule here is do not eat the art as always. That said, uh, brittle silks produce a lot of dust, especially if they're shattering or in poor condition. So fragile items with higher concentrations of heavy metals will get boxed and labeled so that we can avoid coming into unnecessary contact with them. We also make sure to practice good PPE rules, making sure that we wear gloves and lab coats and to wash our hands after handling these objects and before eating. The highest concentrations of arsenic we found were on shoes, that's 74 or 54 to 79 parts per million, and green silk leaves, um, that's about 131 parts per million, specifically those from late 19th century wedding ensembles. That's what you see in the bottom right corner of the screen here. We also tested the tissue paper that was underneath the flowers to see if the arsenic was capable of transferring, and we found low levels of arsenic on the tissue paper. We then performed an informal crocking test where we rubbed fresh clean tissue on the leaves. Um, and again, we saw that a small amount of arsenic transferred. This was a good reminder to safely dispose of old packing materials and gloves that may have come into contact with hazardous material. Uh, we've looked at many Native American pieces in search of pesticides. Today, we don't use pesticides within the museum. We focus on monitoring and prevention to keep storage clean and safe. But during the 20th century, organic materials were sometimes coated with harmful substances to deter rodents and insects from using them as a food source. At RISD, we have textiles and garments extracted from indigenous communities by George High, whose collection became the basis for the National Museum of the American Indian. Uh, these high foundation pieces have really distinctive ink labels, such as this vest here. Um, you can see one of those high foundation labels. It's written like a fraction. Um, often in a very visible spot. Um, and so from other conservators telling us that they knew pesticides were in use with these pieces, um, we really wanted to make sure that we tested them here as well. We were specifically looking for arsenic trioxide, lead arsenate, and mercuric chloride based on the advice of others. 
Um, on the high foundation pieces we've surveyed, we found heavy metals and pesticides on fur, leather, and horse hair elements, including 106 parts per million lead, 106 parts per million mercury, and 48 parts per million arsenic on this K-pop cap in the top left corner, as well as 1,221 parts per million lead um, on this Absoluca amulet. Luckily, wool garments such as the Santi dress on the right and these two Danae wearing blankets on the left were not found to contain arsenic, mercury, lead, or other red flag pesticide elements. This has allowed us to safely and confidently connect cultural belongings with artists, students, and stakeholders, and to provide better care for those pieces which are potentially hazardous. Legally, you have to inform visitors about pesticides on cultural materials if you know they are present. But even if you are uncertain, we always want to inform visiting stakeholders about the potential risks. The last thing you want to do is to conceal health and safety hazards because you're unsure or uncomfortable having that conversation if it means putting someone in danger. So we feel much better being able to share firm numbers for these pieces. Most recently, at the request of a researcher, we looked at a pre-Columbian Andean textile that was painted on the front and potentially printed on the back. The researcher asked us to do XRF because we had that technology available for free. She was hoping to learn more about when the printed pigments on the back had been applied, uh, but the painting on the front had bled through to the back, so it was impossible to isolate that pigment using XRF. Uh, but we went forward with this anyways because we wanted to learn more about this interesting and unique textile. The presence of potassium, aluminum, calcium, iron, copper, and manganese are all typical of Andean dyeing techniques and are in line with XRF readings from pieces at NMAI and the Getty. Some results were surprising though. We saw no lead in any of the pigments, which was unlike similar pieces, and we saw consistent results of magnesium and zinc. This may be useful in dating the textile to post-contact, as some older articles state that zinc is not found in Andean soil or pre-contact pigments. However, recently, uh, the use of zinc in earlier textiles has been debated, and so we hope that the readings from this piece can contribute to this evolving discussion, um, as well as help us in dating and orienting this textile. I will be brief as my experience is limited to objects and wallpaper. The first XRF project I was involved with was testing the museum's fine portraits and the painting of the Roman god Heron. The museum has three ancient panel paintings, including one of only three surviving framed pieces from Greco-Roman Egypt. In 2016, the RISD Museum joined the International Program on Ancient Panel Paintings, Examination, Analysis, and Research, which from here on will be called APIR, to share data among institutions to learn more about the techniques, materials used, and micro traditions of these funerary portraits. With Dr. Murray, we tested the surfaces of the panels with the XRF unit, and we found calcium in the white tunics, carbon in the pupils and hair, and actual gold in the laurel crown. In the lips, we found mercury and sulfur, consistent with the recipe for cinnabar red. The lavender sash was also calcium rich, which could be evidence of the artisan's use of Tyrian purple, the dye made from boiling thousands of desiccated spiny murex sea snails in lead vats in order to extract purple dye from their mucus glands. In 2018, Dr. Murray came back to the museum to test trace pigments on Etruscan antifixes. While XRF is helpful in determining the presence of certain elements, to learn more about these architectural ornaments, we need to use more intrusive methods of analysis to draw further conclusions. Gina Borromeo, the curator of ancient art, and Dr. Catherine Cooper wrote an article for our in-house publication manual. Their work is in the issue titled Polychrome, and Catherine Cooper's beautiful diagram is what has inspired all of my notes and diagrams since. And as Anna Rose mentioned earlier, we had Dr. Murray come to test a survey of our 18th and 19th century English and French wallpapers. Because the pigment in printmaking is so concentrated, we found toxic levels of arsenic present in most of the wallpapers. Because arsenic is only really dangerous when aerosolized or ingested, we felt safe provided we wore the appropriate PPE and did not agitate the particles. And because of the levels of arsenic, we were able to secure an NEH grant to rehouse these wallpapers. And we started a multi-year project cleaning and documenting this collection, which was previously untouched for about 100 years. 
In this case, XRF data helped the museum tell a compelling, urgent story to potential funders. Our second wallpaper tests found more arsenic and mercuric chloride. In July of last year, we used XRF analysis with Dr. Murray to test the surface of a carved wooden sculpture of Vishnu and deities Lakshmi and Sarasvati. Traditionally, Indian painting was very prescriptive and artisans only used certain materials. Instead of finding elements that produced those pigments, we found mostly titanium, which was not isolated as a pigment and distributed until much later. Our leading theory is that this piece has a history of restoration that we are not aware of. Here, XRF can help us fill the gaps created by missing and incomplete records. Just like in the case of the antifixes, we do not know enough just by the elemental data. Only by taking a sample of the wood will we be able to learn more about the species of tree used, which could narrow down the location of origin. Our next tests were looking for pesticides on indigenous collections. We tested baskets, a food box, quill pouches, and some feathers. And with the help of Dr. Catherine Cooper and the NCPTT, we examined these lusterware pieces. We concluded that there was no silver or platinum as there should be, and instead arsenic, lead, and mercury were used for the glazes. This knowledge informed our future cleaning and housing of these objects. We also tested some Diné silver jewelry, including this beautiful squash blossom necklace. Uh, in some cases, we may take readings and then send them to other scholars uh, for interpretation and analysis. As conservators, we have a lot of access to works of art, and we can use our unique position to facilitate scholarship and cultural revitalization by providing data to larger projects. Recently, we've shared XRF scans of Northwest Coast native Chilkat robes with the Chilkat Dye Project a group that spans indigenous weavers from the Chilkat Dye Working Group, Ellen Carley and other conservators from the Alaska State Museum, as well as Dario Durastanti um, and conservation scientists from Portland State University. The major aim of this project is to provide modern indigenous weavers with information about the materials utilized by their ancestors, many of which continue to be used today. This foregrounds the priorities of indigenous people and enriches our understanding of these important cultural belongings. Uh, Native students assisted with the mounting and photography of these pieces at RISD, that's what you see on the screen here. So we took readings from these robes years ago in advance of that project to check for pesticides. We're also hoping to learn more about the colorants. So when we were looking for pesticides, we took additional readings of each color after hearing Mary Ballard speak at AIC about the debated use of copper in blue dyes. In this case, we had our XRF readings for nearly two years before we made contact with the Chilkat Dive Working Group, but we are happy to have been able to recollect, reconnect these robes with community weavers and enrich our understanding of Northwest Coast dye stuffs. Uh, all credit to Bree for this infographic and this wonderful slide, as well as Rika Smith McNally at the Hafenreffer Museum, who has a great version of this infographic that shows what an XRF machine can and cannot read. Light elements, such as those at the top of the periodic table, do not show up in XRF results. And most textiles will be more than 90% light elements, uh, mostly carbon. So XRF would not be useful in telling linen, cotton, or other animal fibers apart. Simple microscopy would work much better for that. There are other methods, such as gas chromatography and HPLC, that can provide more specific information about the additives and dye stuff present in a fiber. Uh, so for example, if we wanted to tell the difference between two similar lichen dyes, we would not use XRF to answer that question. It can't really tell plant-based materials apart. But XRF is really useful for getting a broad idea about dye additives, finishes, paints, tanning processes, and other applied decorations especially those with metal elements like mordants, pigments, and pesticides. All XRF interpretation is based on comparing your results to other things with known elemental composition. You can build a database yourself if you have the time and access to samples, but we rely on comparing our results to published scholarship. When we get the XRF results, we simply get a list of the elements that are present. You can use the results to draw conclusions about the date, of when an object was made or the place materials were sourced from, but only if you have something to compare your results to. We'll talk more about resources later, but some of the resources we rely heavily on include the list of pesticides and old poisons new problems, 
and recipes for paints in the artist's handbook, shown here. Preparing for XRF analysis ahead of time ensures that we get good usable data during each visit. During an analysis day, we don't touch the XRF machine. We leave it to the owners of the unit. We stick to our strengths and trust them to do the same. We might indicate where we would like the machine to take a reading, but we focus on handling the objects and making sure we keep track of what each result relates to. It's important to be adaptable. Each XRF session will be a little different, so it's helpful to have an open mind. You might have to change up your idea of how the day will go, depending on various factors. If you've never been in the room when an analysis is taking place, it's not clear what to expect. Here's what it's been like for us. For the day of analysis, we need the XRF machine and the scientist handling it, as well as calibration disks. We use a sample of Montana soil with known elemental levels. The XRF unit is first calibrated by scanning soil samples with the known elemental standards. This establishes our confidence in the accuracy of the machine's readings. We also would like to have printed out images of all the pieces to be tested for labeling purposes and extension cords so that the computer and the unit can stretch to move around the object, a notebook and a dedicated note taker, a cell phone or camera to take initial images of the results on the screen, gloves for handling potentially hazardous materials, and transparent film to go between the XRF and the objects. Each scan takes 120 seconds. There's an initial report after 60 seconds and final results after 120 seconds. The machine must be held steady during this time and can be rested directly on the object. If you are worried about the unit coming into contact with a piece, you can put a piece of clear film between the art and the reader. We also like having foam scraps to go under objects. The area of focus for the reading is half an inch wide. If a textile has a loose weave structure, then the machine may read in between the yarns and scan whatever is underneath the object. You can avoid contamination by putting archival foam or similar material made from light elements underneath your textile. If we can leave you with anything, I hope it will be the importance of having a note taker during the analysis. It's very easy to lose track of which scans connect to which parts in an object, especially if you have to repeat some scans or if some scans are aborted due to movement disrupting the laser. We will often have multiple note takers on the day of. I keep number lists that pair accession numbers with scan numbers, as well as site locations and initial elemental data. I found it helpful to have printouts, like on the slide, of the object we're testing. If I just take photos, Sometimes I will either take shots that are too broad and I miss the exact site entirely, or the shot is too close up and I miss where, I miss where the site is relative to the whole object. Once the 120 second scan is complete, I like to take a quick cell phone image of the screen, the computer screen itself. I find that this screen view, um, what you see over there on the left, is much easier to extrapolate from uh, than that exported Excel data. And we can also upload these images directly into our database. This is what the results of an afternoon of scanning looks like when it's printed out. Each scan represents one row in a spreadsheet and the column represents individual elements plus the margin of error, calibration results for that element. You can view the calibration results as plot points on a graph to get a better idea of how accurately the machine read that element. When interpreting the results, if we see mercury, which is HG, lead, PB, and arsenic, AS, we have to take note. We can assume that the presence of these might be linked to certain common pesticides, such as lead arsenate and mercuric chloride but we don't need to know the exact pesticide to know that these pieces should be treated with caution. As we've mentioned, uh, this methodology really lives and dies on comparison. If you cannot connect your results to known elemental levels in other objects, then it's really hard to draw conclusions. Uh, that said, there are so many amazing resources online and in print, and we've been gathering them for so long, and we'd really like to share them with you. So we've set up a Google Drive to house all of the free resources we've found that are related to XRF analysis. This drive is accessible to everyone. You can download articles, add comments, upload new resources, and we've created a spreadsheet guide to the drive uh, seen here on the right side of the screen that we've organized into a few loose categories. So you can access this at this link here, bit.ly uh, slash XRF drive, or you can use your phone, scan this QR code, check it out for yourself. 
Um, the first tab is hundreds of free resources, all available online. Many of these are peer-reviewed published scholarship, but there are also conference posters, presentations, as well as manuals and guidelines for the non-specialists. And the second tab, we have recommended paid resources. Many amazing conservators have published books and compendiums that are very worth your time. So if you have a budget, these are well worth your money. And the third tab, we have links to programs, workshops, and videos. These are things you can watch with, engage, um, and as we see more upcoming programs, we'll add them here. Lastly, we have a miscellaneous tab. Uh, many of these are currently unpublished things that we hope we will one day find, uh, but if you have something that you feel doesn't fit into the other categories, uh, please add it there. So as you begin to consider how you might use XRF analysis in your practice, getting started can be overwhelming. There's so much information out there that it's hard to navigate and collate everything. So we've included some information about which resources have and haven't worked for us in the comments tab of our spreadsheet, but we also really encourage you to reach out to us um, and we really welcome more discussion about this. We hope that we can repay the kindness others have shown to us uh, by being a resource for all of you. So please feel free to reach out. Our emails are here if you have any questions or you would like to discuss any part of this further. Uh, and then we'd like to end by giving a real special thanks to everybody we work with and everyone who has helped us um, firstly, of course, our conservation team at RISD, that would be Ingrid Newman, Jess Zierich, and Kristen Fitzgerald, but also to the many conservators, scientists, industrial hygienists, chemists, um, and so on, who have um, helped us gain uh, this information and interpret it as well. So um, thank you very much to the FIT Museum for having us, um, and we hope to hear from you guys soon.